would go ahead and turn with me to Psalm 96. For several weeks, we have been asking and answering this question of uh, who is Jesus, and we've not been, we haven't looked at just his ministry. We've been looking at Jesus himself. We've been looking at more than just his attributes. We've been looking at who he is as a person, who he is as the Son of God, who he truly is from a biblical perspective. Because when we stop and ask that question, who is Jesus, the answer is, the answers will vary depending on who you ask. If you go out and ask a bunch of people who is Jesus, you'll get a bunch of different answers to that question because people have different perspectives, people have different understandings, people have different interpretations of who Jesus is. But when you and I answer that question, we want to make sure that who we say Jesus is is rooted in the text. We want to make sure that who we say Jesus is is rooted in the scriptures. Because if we are following in, if we are believing in, if we are trusting in a Jesus, other than the Jesus that is put forward in scriptures, we are trusting in, following in, believing in a false Jesus. We are trusting in a Savior that we have created in our own image, a God that we have created in our own image. And so we must always make sure that the Jesus we follow the Jesus we believe in, the Jesus we profess faith in, is the Jesus that is revealed to us in the scriptures, because he's the only hope that any of us have. He's the only hope for salvation. He is the only way to the Father. And so over the past several weeks, we've been asking this question, who is Jesus? Going to the Bible, looking at the text to see who Jesus is. And in the beginning of it, we found that Jesus is eternal. He's the eternal Son of God. There has been no point in which Jesus has not existed. The eternal Son of God, he, he stands outside of time. He is outside of this constraint that you and I find ourselves in. Time is a construct that we live within. Eternity is outside the construct of time. And so it's interesting when you stop and think about it that before time began, Christ existed. Before creation existed, Christ existed. Jesus is the eternal Son of God and he is the agent of creation. The Father spoke, the Son brought it into being. The Father spoke, Jesus is the one who brings creation into being. So Jesus is the eternal Son of God. And we saw that he's fully human. When we think about Jesus and his humanity, we're quick to picture him taking on a human body, but he did more than take on just a human body when he was born into the world. He took on all of humanity, but without sin. He was human just like you and I. He, there's not an emotion that you and I f have experienced that he didn't experience. He experienced the gamut of emotions. He experienced sorrow, pain, suffering, joy, happiness, everything. Hunger, thirst, all of it. Everything you and I experience in this life, he experienced in his life. And it's a wonderful thing because, as we'll see in a bit, that means he can sympathize with us. He knows what we're going through. He knows what it's like to live in this world. Jesus is the eternal son of God. He is fully human, took on all of humanity without sin. Uh, we've also seen that he is the second person of the triune Godhead. When we think about God and we come to the scriptures, we find that there is one God and he exists in three distinct persons, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Three distinct persons, but they are one in their essence meaning there's nothing that separates them. There's no division. There's three distinct persons, but there's still one because they're the same in the essence. There's no separation, no division. And so we say that Jesus is the second person of the triune Godhead, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. And the three are one because there's one God. And Jesus, the second person of the triune Godhead, is our loving Savior. It's out of love for us that he gave his life for us. It is out of love for us that the Father sent his Son in the world, into the world to die for us. The love of Christ is unconditional love. The love of Christ is a perfecting love. The love of Christ is a demonstrated, conspicuous love. The love of Christ is not hidden. And if we know Christ and we love Christ and, and the Holy Spirit dwells within us, then our love is to be seen. Our love is to be demonstrated. We are to love like Christ. We are to love our brothers and sisters in Christ. We are to love our enemies. Our love is to be seen. It's not to be hidden. It is not something in the shadows. It's more than a warm, fuzzy feeling for somebody. Our love is to be demonstrated in tangible ways for our brothers and sisters and for those who we would call enemies. Because that's how Christ loves, and we are to love like him. He's our loving Savior. He's also the Lord. He's the eternal Son of God, all-powerful, sovereign, King of kings, 
who is above all. There is no other name above his. There is no name that surpasses the name of Jesus Christ. You can go out, you can take all the money you have, start a foundation, raise all the money in the world, you can go out, cure cancer, cure COVID, cure monkeypox, cure whatever. And people in this world will celebrate you. They will elevate your name. But in the grand scheme of things, it doesn't matter because it doesn't matter what you do in this life. Your name will never be greater than the name of Jesus. Nobody's name is above his because he is the Lord. Sovereign over all, King of kings, Lord of lords. His name is great. And his name is to greatly be praised. And as we saw last week, Jesus is our great high priest. He's our mediator. He's our go-between. He's the one who has made the once-for-all sacrifice through the shedding of his blood on the cross, his innocent blood on the cross, so that we who are guilty of sin could be forgiven and set free. If you go back to the Old Testament, as we saw last week, the chief priest was tasked with offering the perfect sacrifice, a spotless sacrifice for the sins of the people continually. Annually, every year on the Day of Atonement, the right sacrifice had to be offered. And in in what took place on that day, any time a sacrifice was made for the sins of the people, the chief priest was tasked with slaughtering an innocent animal, taking its blood, and presenting it to the Lord as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the guilty people. When we look at the cross, Jesus our high priest brought his own blood, his innocent blood before the Father to atone for our sins. The innocent died for the guilty. And he's the mediator. He's the go-between. There is no other way to heaven except through him. And because of him and through faith in him, we have access to the Father. We can come boldly before the throne of grace to receive mercy and grace in our time of need because of Christ. He he gives us access to the Father. He gives us entrance into the kingdom of God. He is the only way to receive eternal life and the hope of heaven. And I hope that you know him. And when we come to the scriptures, we see that Jesus is so much more. We We could spend months asking and answering this question, who is Jesus, and not exhaust the text. Because there's so much about him revealed in the scriptures So much more than what we've looked at in the past seven weeks. But in our time together today, we're going to look at the same question, asking who is Jesus? And when we come to the text, one cannot come to the text asking this question without recognizing that Jesus is the coming judge. He is our Savior. He's also the coming judge of the world. When people talk about God, when they talk about Jesus, they don't mind talking about his love. They don't mind talking about his grace. They don't mind talking about his goodness, his mercy, his salvation, his taking care of our needs. People love to talk about these things. We love to talk about these things. It's nice to talk about these things. It's encouraging to talk about these things. It brings us a sense of peace. It brings us a sense of comfort when we talk about how great God is and how good he is to us, even in these moments when we don't deserve it. But there's one element about God that we often don't like to talk about, and the world certainly does not like to talk about it, and it's his judgment. We don't like to talk about God's judgment because that's not fun, that's not pleasant, that's not pleasing to read. It's not fun to talk about, so we often don't. We often act like it's something that the Bible talks about, but we don't really believe it will ever happen. The world around us certainly doesn't believe it will happen. Most people live as though God is aloof, that he's distant. And they pay little attention to what they're doing each and every day. All you have to do is turn on the news, read the headlines online on a news site, It's evident everywhere around us that the world in which we live does not believe that judgment is coming. We don't glorify the Lord, we glorify sin in the world. 
we call evil good and good evil now on the regular. It used to happen here and there. It's happening on a much more frequent basis now. We as a nation and a world are advocates for evil now. We advocate for evil on a regular basis. As this, this country advocates for evil in a number of ways. That's not fun to talk about. That's not fun to hear. That's reality, though. We are a nation that advocates and condones and endorses evil. And I would agree with many others in the recent weeks and months who have come out and said that in this time we find ourselves living in, we right now are being led by more evil people than ever before. Amen. It's sad to say it. It's sad to see it. But what's even more sad is the fact that we're seeing it within the church today. And that's further evidence that we don't take God seriously. We don't take God at his word. We don't take him as being honest when he says judgment is coming. If you will, look, looking at Psalm 96. Psalm 96 is a psalm that we studied in depth earlier this year. Um, so I'm not going to go through it line by line. We're not going to do like this deep dive into Psalm 96 here again today. Uh, psalm 96, though, just for a summary, is it's a psalm calling Israel to sing a new song of praise. It's a psalm calling Israel to sing a new song of praise. A new song of praise to the Lord that blesses his name. A new song to the Lord that glorifies his name, that tells of his salvation, that declares his glory to the nations, and tells of his marvelous works among the peoples. Because he is great, he is greatly to be praised. Israel was to make the greatness of God known to the world around them, to all the nations. And they were to do so by telling them about what, who God is and what he has done for them, what he continually does for them. And talking about his greatness, his goodness, his glory, the marvelous works he's done, those are things we like to talk about. We, again, we have no problem talking about those things. They're fun to talk about. But jump down to verse 10. And specifically in verse 10, look at the last line of that verse. The last line of verse 10 reads, speaking of God, speaking of the Lord, speaking of Yahweh, he will judge the peoples with equity. He will judge the peoples with equity. And the psalmist is looking ahead to a time to come. The Lord, God, is going to judge the peoples with equities. It's plural. That's a reference to all peoples, not just some peoples. That's a reference to all peoples, all the nations, every tribe, every tongue, everyone will be judged. The world is going to be judged by God. He's going to do it with equity. That means he's going to deal with everyone fairly and justly. People will be dealt with justly by God. We don't have to worry about that because he is fair. He is true. He is right. He is just. He will deal justly with people in the end. All people, all the world is going to be judged. And that means he's aware of us. That means he's aware of our lives. That means he's paying attention to what we're doing. Whether we're a believer, whether we're an unbeliever, he's paying attention to us. Which means he's not distant. He's not aloof. He's not far off. He's not removed from us. He's more aware of what's going on in our lives and in the lives of others around us than we ourselves even know or can comprehend. And he's proven on different occasions that he is serious about what he says. He's proven on different occasions throughout the course of history that he is serious when, it, when he talks about being obedient to him and being faithful to him in different ways. And one of the first examples we see in the course of time in history is found in Genesis 6 through 8, Noah and the flood. If you look at Genesis 6 through 8, God is looking down on creation. He looks on humanity, who he has created. He sees the wickedness of the people. He sees that their hearts are firmly set on continually doing evil things. And when he looks upon them, God was sorry that he made man and said that he would blot them out from the face of the land, along with the animals that he created as well. And when you read through the text, that's exactly what he did. He told them judgment's coming, 
Noah was spared, his family, Noah's family was spared, the animals on the ark were spared from the judgment, but judgment came for those who were not faithful to God. You can flip over to number 16, and in number 16 we read about Korah's rebellion. Israel was being led by Moses and Aaron in the wilderness at the time. Korah is upset with them, frustrated with them, because they're wandering in the wilderness. He comes with this gripe to them. He's grumbling about where they're at. He's grumbling about the leadership of Moses and Aaron. He's grumbling about their lot in life at that time. And he makes this comparison to them and says that you took us from a good place, which was Egypt, brought us into the wilderness. This is a miserable existence. You should have never done that. And so I'm going to lead this rebellion. I'm, I'm bringing these people against you. And Korah did just that. He brought 250 of the chiefs of the Israelite congregation in opposition to Aaron and to Moses and Aaron. And he's bringing this rebellion against them, but the reality is their rebel his rebellion that he's leading is not actually a rebellion against Moses and Aaron. It's a rebellion against God himself because Moses and Aaron have been tasked and chosen by God to lead the people out of Egypt in through the wilderness and to shepherd these people who do a whole lot of grumbling and complaining, which is a sin before God, because it's a lack of faith. It's a demonstration that you don't trust him. Their rebellion is actually against God as they come against Moses and Aaron. And in response to their rebellion, you find in number 16, that after Korah comes to, comes to Aaron, Moses and Aaron, after he comes to them, with his complaint about their leadership and everything that they've done, the next day, the earth opens up, swallows the household of Korah, everyone related to him, all of their households, into the earth, down into Sheol, the text, I believe, says, and then the earth closes over them. Whether it was an earthquake, whether it was a sinkhole, I like to think, I used to think it was an earthquake. I now am more convinced it was probably a sinkhole that just opened up all of a sudden. <laughs> Down they go. Hole collapses on itself. Korah's family erased from the earth. Every trace of him gone. Judgment in that moment from God for their rebellion, for their disobedience, for their lack of faith, for their lack of trust in God. Just like that, gone from the earth. And after Korah and his household and everyone tied to him is swallowed up, God takes the 250 men, the chiefs of the Israelite congregation who joined him in the rebellion, and he consumes them with fire for everyone to see. And he made it known in those moments It needs to be taken seriously. And then you have in Genesis 19, Sodom and Gomorrah. The people of Sodom had given themselves over to evil practices continually. Their hearts were bent towards evil completely. They'd given themselves over to predominantly homosexual practices. That was what was common. That's what Sodom was known for was their homosexual practices at the time. It was rampant among the people. And it was so bad, their depravity had reached such a point that when two angels of God came into the city to visit Lot, when these two angels of God come into the city, the men of Sodom went to Lot's household because they wanted to have their way with what they believed were two men that had come to visit Lot. They were trying to knock the, Lot's door down so that they could have their way with these two men that were with Lot. And that's how depraved things had become. The angels had been sent by God to Lot into the city, first to, to take Lot and his family and deliver them out of the city, but they were also sent there by God to bring judgment and destruction on the city itself. And so the angels make this known to Lot, they make it known to his family, and Lot and his family, they, they kind of drag their feet on getting out of the city. Finally, the, the angels get Lot, get his wife, and get the daughters out of the city. And then as soon as they're out of the city, what does God do? He rains 
sulfur and fire on Sodom and Gomorrah in judgment. And on the next day, Abraham goes out to the place where he stood and where he met the Lord and where all of this was told to Abraham when it was told to him that these things were going to take place. Abraham standing on the spot where he met with the Lord. He's looking over the valley where Sodom and Gomorrah was and as he looks over it the next morning, smoke is coming up from the land like smoke coming up from a furnace. Gone. Judgment come. City leveled. People dead. I think we get the picture that when God says he will judge the peoples with equity, he means what he says. God's not aloof. God's not distant. He is aware of everything taking place in the world. And people will be held accountable. And we see from the scriptures that they will be held accountable by Jesus himself. In 2 Timothy 4.1, Paul, he's writing to Timothy, and Paul, writing to him, charges him to preach the word in the presence of God and Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead. In James 4.12, James, who's writing to dispersed Christians and addressing the, the causes of quarreling and fighting among them, said, There is only one lawgiver and judge, he who is able to save and destroy. And in chapter 5, verse 9, James went on to say, Behold, the judge is standing at the door. And when you read the context of James, when you read through chapters 4 and 5, you recognize that each time he's talking about the judge, he is talking about Jesus himself. Jesus is the judge. Jesus is the one who is standing at the door. If he's standing at the door, he's ready to come at any time. He's just waiting for the Father to say, go. He's not sitting in heaven twiddling his thumbs. He's sitting there ready to go when the Father says, go. Judgment is coming, and people need to be prepared for when Jesus comes again because it's coming. It's not a question of if, it's a question of when. It's not a question of is Jesus going to come, is Jesus going to judge the world, it is. He is going to do these things, it's just a matter of when. During his life and ministry, Jesus <coughs> knew why the Father had sent him into the world. If you will, jump with me to the Gospel of John, specifically John chapter 3. John chapter 3, looking at verses um, 16 and 17. Many familiar with verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Verse 17. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Like I said, verse 16 is possibly the most well-known verse in the Bible, but verse 17 shows that when Jesus came into the world, he came to save the world. He didn't come to condemn the world. He didn't come to judge the world when he came the first time. He came to give his life so that people could be saved. And Jesus echoed this in John chapter 12, verse 47. If you want to jump over, John chapter 12, verse 47. Here Jesus said, If anyone hears my words and does not keep them, I do not judge him. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. When the Father sent the Son, he's born into the world, he takes on flesh, he takes on humanity, he grows up, he lives, and he's living and ministering to the people. Jesus knows why he came. He knows the will of the Father. He knows why he's been sent. He has been sent into the world to give his life as a sacrifice so that sin could be atoned for, so that people could trust in him, so that people could be forgiven, so that people could have eternal life and freedom from the control of sin, and to have the hope of eternal life in him and through him. Jesus didn't come. He wasn't sent the first time into the world in order to judge or condemn the world. He didn't come to condemn. He came to save, because that was the will of the Father. That was why the Father sent him, and Jesus always does what the Father wills for him to do. He never disobeys the Father. He always does what the Father wills for him to do. But during the course of his ministry, during his life, 
He knows he's been sent into the world to die so that people can be saved. He knows he's been sent into the world to save the world. But just because Jesus didn't come to judge the world doesn't mean that he won't. Because the text tells us that Jesus knew the authority that had been given to him and what he would be doing someday. Turn back to John chapter 5. John chapter 5, Jesus is addressing the Jews who were seeking to kill him um, because they believed he was breaking the Sabbath and claiming to be equal to God, which were um, punishable crimes. Um, claiming to be equal with God was blasphemy and that was punishable by death. The Jews did not believe that Jesus was the Son of God in the flesh, and so any time he made any reference that, that um, equated him to the Father in heaven, they saw it as open blasphemy. They saw it as, uh, as legitimate grounds for him to be put to death. Uh, they also believed that he was doing work on the Sabbath. If he healed someone or performed a miraculous work on the Sabbath, they would accuse him of working on the Sabbath. Uh, they saw him as a lawbreaker, even though he wasn't, because Jesus could do these things. He is the Son of God in the flesh. He can equate himself with the Father, because he and the Father are one. There's one God existing in three distinct persons, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ, fully God, in the flesh, Again, the Jews didn't see him that way, so they thought he was a blasphemer. They wanted to put him to death. <clears throat> and so they're coming against Jesus. But Jesus here in, um, in chapter 5 starts to draw out and show the authority that he has to show that he is, in fact, God in the flesh before them. But I want us to look specifically at verses 27 through 29 in John chapter 5. Jesus said, speaking of the Father, and he has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the son of man do not marvel at this for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment the father before christ had come into the, the father had already given the son the authority to judge the world to execute judgment because he is the son of man but it was not yet the Father's will for him to execute that judgment. He will execute the judgment at a later time when he comes again. And all who have died will be raised to life. And those who have done good, meaning those who trusted in him and him alone for their salvation, will be resurrected to the resurrection of life, eternal life. Those who have done evil, meaning those who have not trusted in him, will be raised to the resurrection of judgment. Right now, you and I are in this waiting period. We're in this holding pattern, so to speak. This pocket of time in the course of time in human history in which grace is dispensed and people have the opportunity to trust in Christ and be forgiven of their sins and receive eternal life. We live in this pocket of time, this narrow window of grace in which people can trust in Christ and be forgiven of their sins. But that time, that window, is growing smaller and smaller and smaller with each second that goes by. There's going to be a time when that time of grace, the age of grace, ceases. There's going to be a time when the Lord comes again there's going to be a time when judgment is executed by the one who has been given the authority by the Father in heaven to execute such judgment. Turn towards the end of your Bible to Revelation chapter 20. Here we'll look at verses 11 through 15. Here, John, in, in his revelation, writes, beginning in verse 11, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it. From his presence earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. 
Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. After the tribulation period, after the culmination of the millennial kingdom on earth and the final defeat of Satan, the dead will stand before the great white throne of judgment. The books are going to be open, one the book of life, the others are records of things people have done. And as we see clearly in the text, those whose name is not found in the book of life will be they will be cast into the lake of fire. The book of life contains the names of all who trust in Christ and Christ alone for the forgiveness of their sins. The book of life contains the names of those who will enter into heaven. The book of life is the book in which the names of the saved are recorded. If a person's name is not in the book of life, then we see where their end will be. The second death, lake of fire. Judgment is being rendered. Judgment is being executed. When we talk about judgment, we're really talking about condemnation. And that's going to be the final experience for unbelievers. As they stand before the Lord, they will be once for all, for eternity, condemned to separation from the God, separation from his love, separation from him for eternity, separation from him experiencing his wrath for sin, for their sin, for what they have done, everything recorded that they have done against him in the books. See, when it comes to sin, sin has to be paid for in some form or fashion. God cannot allow sin to go unpunished. It has to be dealt with. And one way or another, our sin is going to be dealt with. Either our sin is dealt with through Christ on the cross, who experiences the wrath of the Father for our sin in our place, or we will experience the wrath of the Father ourselves for eternity for the sins we have committed if we don't trust in Christ and Christ alone. One way or another, our sin will be dealt with, and it will be dealt with justly. If you've trusted in Christ, you won't experience the wrath of the Father. If you haven't trusted in Christ, You will. And when it comes to those who have trusted in Christ, when it comes to believers, when it comes to those who have trusted in Christ and Christ alone for salvation, believing that he lived, that he died, that he was buried and raised from the dead, believers in Jesus have no, no need to fear being condemned by God at any point in time. If you have truly, genuinely trusted in Christ and Christ alone, For the forgiveness of your sins, you have no need to fear God's condemnation. One of the best evidences of that is Romans 8.1, where Paul wrote, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That is forever. If you are in Christ, you have no fear of condemnation. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Christ Jesus. We don't have to fear being condemned to hell, but we would do well as believers in Christ to remember that as believers in Christ, we will still give an account of our lives to the Lord. In the in Romans, if you turn to chapter 8, turn over to chapter 14. Romans 14 verses 10 through 12. <clears throat> Paul here again writing said Why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or you, why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. And you have to keep in mind, 
Paul's writing to Christians when he's writing this text. When he wrote this letter, he's writing to genuine believers in Jesus Christ, genuine people who have trusted in Christ, and they are saved. He's writing to them, and he's saying, For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. And then in verse 12 he said, So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. As I said before, God is aware of everything that we do. He's not blind to anything in our lives. He's not blind to anything that happens around us. He is aware of all that we do. He's aware of all that's going on around us. Nothing is out of his sight. When you trusted in Christ and Christ alone for your salvation, you were forever forgiven of your sin. Your sin, past, present, and future, was dealt with for eternity. And in that moment you trusted in Christ, not only were you forgiven, not only were you given eternal life, the Holy Spirit came and indwelled you, you were given spiritual life in him and through him. But in that moment you trusted in Christ, you were also given freedom. You're given freedom from the penalty of sin and death. You're given freedom from condemnation to eternal separation from God. But at the same time, you're also given freedom from the rule and control of sin in your life. When you trusted in Christ and Christ alone for the forgiveness of your sins and the Holy Spirit came within you to indwell you, in that moment, you're enabled through the presence of the Spirit and by his power to say no to sin and yes to faithfully following the Lord. You have the ability through the Holy Spirit indwelling you to say no to sin and yes to Christ out of love for him and what he's done for you. Prior to trusting in Christ, before you trusted in Christ, your heart is ruled and bent and controlled by sin. That fallen sinful nature that we all inherited before you trusted in Christ, that is your master. Sin is the master of everyone who doesn't know Christ. And when you're in that state, you can't say no to sin and yes to faithfully following Christ. You can't say no to sin and following Jesus out of love for him. Because when sin is your master, when before you trust in Christ, that's what your heart is predisposed towards. That's what your heart loves. That's what you want to pursue. And it control it runs every aspect of your life. It's not until we trust in Christ that we find freedom from the control of sin in our lives. It's not until we trust in Christ and the Holy Spirit indwells us that we have the ability to walk free from sin, to say no to sin and yes to faithfully following the Lord. And it's important to know that because we are going to give, every believer is going to give an account to the Lord for their life. And so the question we would do well to consider and understand as believers is, what are we doing with our freedom? What are we doing with the spiritual freedom that God has graciously given to us through his Son? What are we doing with that freedom from the rule and reign and control of sin in our hearts and in our lives? One way to kind of assess that is to look at what you do with your time and your money and the things that you value and it will be very revealing. If you look at your time and your resources and what you do with them, it will give a good example as to what we're doing with our freedom. Are we using the things that God has given to us to glorify God or are we being good steward or are we are we using the things that God has given to us to glorify God or are we using them to fulfill selfish personal desires or sinful desires are we taking the resources that God has graciously entrusted to us and being good stewards of them in this world to demonstrate the love of Christ or are we taking the resources talents everything that God has given to us and using them for our own purposes, our own selfish gain. These are things we should strongly consider and we should look at. What do we do with our time? 
Do we spend our time regularly serving the Lord, or do we find ourselves taking more and more time to spend on ourselves? Are we taking time to pursue the things that the Lord would have us to do in this world, to minister to others around us, or are we taking that time to indulge in some sort of sinful pleasures? One of the things I hate most about online streaming services is the fact that you can sit there and binge watch shows. You can watch episode after episode after episode after episode after episode. Been there and done it. Hate to admit it. I stop and look back on things like that and I think, what a waste of time. That time's never coming back. Can't go back, can't reclaim it, can't do anything about it. Wasted it. And it was time during hours I could have been out doing something for somebody else, serving the Lord, doing something to honor him, because I would almost guarantee whatever I was binge-watching was not edifying to him or glorifying to him. What do we do with our time? What do we do with our money? What are we doing with the resources, the talents, the things that God has given to us, entrusted to us to be good stewards of? Are we being good stewards of those things, or are we using them for ourselves? Are we using them for sin? Are we using them for selfish gain? What are we doing with the freedom that God has given to us through his Son? In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul again writing... said in verses 10 through 15, according to the grace of God given to me like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest for the day will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. I heard several people throughout the years say, there will be a lot of people in eternity who smell like smoke, because everything that they said they were doing in the name of the Lord was being done in service to themselves. Their pride, their ego, out of jealousy, whatever it might be. It looks like they're building on the foundation of God. It looks like they're doing that in ministry only to come to the end and find out the motives weren't right behind what they were doing. Because that's what Paul's talking about here is what's what's the motive behind what we're doing? What's the motive behind the things we choose to do, the things we choose not to do? Is our motive... uh, this desire out of love for the Savior to serve him, to minister to others, to glorify him through our lives each and every day. Is that the motive that drives us to do the things that we do, or is it something else within us, something self-serving, something sinful that drives us to do the things that we do with the freedom that Christ has given to us, the freedom that Christ has purchased for us? One day we will give an account to him. One day, we will stand before him. One day, we are going to have to show what we did with the freedom that Christ purchased with his innocent blood to atone for our sin. One day, we will have to give an account to the eternal Son of God who is sent into the world, who is 100% innocent, and yet willingly laid down his life, dying on the cross, so that we could be saved and be free. One day we will give an account as to what we did with the life that he has given to us, what we did with the freedom that he has given to us, what we did as his people in this world. Everyone will stand before God Everyone will give an account. Everyone will stand before the Son because he is the coming judge. When he comes again, judgment's coming with him. When he comes again, what's wrong is going to be made right. 
when he comes again, those who have never trusted in Christ will be condemned for eternity. But those who have trusted in Christ, they will enter into heaven, but they will give an account for what they did with their lives, what they did with the resources, what they did with their time, what they did with the freedom. And they will either be rewarded or watch it all burn up in smoke. What are we doing with the freedom God has given to us through his son? Are we living for the Lord, living for ourselves, living for something else? But are we using the freedom to glorify the one who is coming again? Do we use the freedom to point people to the one who is coming again? Do we use the freedom he has given to us to point others to him? Christ is coming, and judgment's coming with him. And my hope is that all of us are ready because the window of time is getting shorter. You are closer now to seeing Jesus than you were before you walked into this room. Are you ready? And Father, my hope and prayer is that we all are. My hope and prayer is that everyone here knows Christ. My hope and prayer, Father, is that your spirit would move in the hearts of those who don't, that you would bring conviction, that you would break them of their sin, that you would break their hearts over their sin. I pray, Father, that your spirit would make their life just so heavy until they see their need for Jesus. And I pray, Father, that they would trust in him because he is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to you except through him. And we thank you that you have given your son out of love for us. We thank you that through your son we can be forgiven. We thank you that through your son we have freedom from the rule of sin in our lives. I pray, Father, that we would be good steward of, stewards of the time, talents, resources, gifts, everything that you have given to us. May we steward those things well. May we redeem the time. May we be faithful followers of you truly living for you and not living for ourselves because it's not about us it's all about you God we love you and we give you thanks we thank you for your word we pray and ask these things in Jesus name by your spirit Amen